when they're recording this. Okay, okay. This, is, this is the um, first of a series of webinars hosted by the Western Bird Banding Association. We hope to have one every month over the next several months. And to, to do the inaugural one, um, Nicole Butner from Un Poco del Choco, uh, a little uh, nonprofit and um, uh, re private reserve in Ecuador, is going to talk about the challenges and opportunities of bird banding and demographic research in Ecuador. Um, I'd like to ask everybody to mute their microphones if they're not talking. And if you could hold your questions to the end. No, I'm, I'm actually just kidding about that because we have, as a little bit of background, we held this webinar about a few days ago and I forgot to hit the record button. So Nicole has very graciously um, agreed to come back on and give me a private um, webinar, um, which I'm going to record successfully this kind and this time and post. Okay, Nicole, thanks very much. Um, and thanks especially for doing this a second time and go ahead and take it away. Yeah, thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure. <laughs> um, just to make sure you're only seeing my slides now because something I am. changed on my screen. Okay, no, that's perfect then. Okay, yeah, so second time around. <laughs> thank you again um, for, for the invitation and the opportunity um, that the IVP and WBBA gave me uh, to present our birding, uh, bird banding program here in Ecuador as part of this webinar series. Um, I'll be talking today about bird banding and demographic research in Ecuador um, and the challenges and opportunities that I have encountered during my work here. So um, as many of you might know, Ecuador is a small country on the Pacific side of South America. It's uh, situated right at the equator. That's also where the name comes from, Ecuador. Um, and it high diversity in bird species. Um, in fact, it's the country with the highest density of bird species worldwide. Um, but um, avian research on our 1,633 uh, bird species is actually still quite scarce, especially long-term studies on our bird populations. And the major obstacle is that despite this huge avian diversity, Ecuador doesn't have a national banding scheme. So I own a small nature reserve and biological station in the northwest of Ecuador, which is named Un Poco del Choco. Um, we're situated in the so-called Choco Andino, um, which is the transition zone between the two biodiversity hotspots of the Tumbus Choco Magdalena, which is uh, colored in green on this map, and the tropical Andes. And since our reserve is just a little part of that, we gave it the name Un Poco de Choco, a little bit of the Choco. So on a local scale, we are part of an area of conservation and sustainable land use, um, which is named after our river here, Acus Pachijal. And additionally, the Choco Andino region was declared a biosphere reserve by the UNESCO in 2018. We are also part of the important bird area of Mashpi Pachijal, which was declared in 2014. And this was also partly supported um, with bird monitoring data from our reserve. Um, because only in um, our 15 hectares, which are about 30 acres, um, we have uh, registered more than 290 bird species. And among them are many um, endemics to the Choco, and um, some of them are also listed as threatened by the IUCN. Um, so our work here at Mpoko del Choco is all about conservation, education, research. And apart from uh, ecotourism, our main source of funding for our research and conservation projects comes from our study abroad program. Um, so we... Um, we have the biological station here where we host researchers and provide undergraduate and graduate students with the opportunity to carry out supervised research projects. This can be internship projects, um, but also bachelor or master thesis. Um, then we also offer students to participate in our ongoing research projects and get an insight into um, tropical field work. So the students assist us with various projects at the station and they're instructed and supervised by me. 
throughout. Um, apart from that, I also teach tropical ecology courses and of course also group banding workshops. As um, part of our conservation work, we are now also part of the forest school network of the Andean Choco um, since 2017. Um, and in cooperation with the primary school in Las Colas, which is the nearest village to our reserve, we have a bird-related environmental education program, um, which brings the kids closer to nature, makes them better observers, and sparks their interest for, and curiosity for nature. But of course, we also do research at the reserve. Um, we have hosted researchers for projects, um, but over the years, we have also developed more and more of our own projects and collaborations. So um, due to my own passion for birds, bird monitoring has always been a part of our ongoing research in the reserve and in the surrounding area here. Um, but as I live and work here, um, I also always wanted to incorporate a bird banding into our bird monitoring program. Um, so We've been catching banding birds since 2014. Um, this project has grown bigger and bigger in the last couple of years. And now it has actually become our main part of our research work. Um, but to get started with this, with it uh, was actually not so easy. So um, I had learned about bird banding um, during a tropical ecology course in Brazil when I was um, doing my master's. Um, and, but I wanted to get a little bit more experience before I actually started to capture and ban, ban birds here in the reserve. Uh, and that's where I encountered my first personal challenge, which, which was that, um, that there are no training opportunities here in Ecuador. So um, if you want to learn how to properly ban birds, um, people usually had to get training outside of the country. Um, so I got trained in England um, and I also volunteered uh, for a bit with Corvidi in Peru um, before I started our own program here in the reserve. And then later I took part in a banding course in Colombia to learn more about aging and sexing techniques. Um, and in 2018, then I finally obtained my NABC certification in Costa Rica. Um, and in fact, um, as far as I know, I'm still the only person from Ecuador who is NABC certified. Um, another minor challenge um, that's, um, is also that most of our equipment isn't available here in Ecuador. So um, my bands, um, I'm ordering them at Fursana in England um, and most of the other equipment in the US. Um, so now that we have everything together, um, in 2014, when I started with the program, I was actually quite ambitious. Um, and I started with nine different banding sites within the reserve, but then with a better understanding of our capture rates and the efforts uh, we have to put in, uh, we cut this down to now three different sites for banding birds regularly. Um, the one on the picture here is one of them. Um, but my favorite station is actually the one right next to my house um, when we set up our bending table under our carport. Um, and we get capture rates in, on average um, between 20 and 30 birds in the morning with um, 16 mist nets for five hours. And we catch quite a huge variety of different birds. So there can be anything from the size of a hummingbird um, starting with hummingbirds. Oh, this one here is actually one of the bigger ones. This is a uh, white-tipped sickle bill, um, and that's our heaviest. Um, but we also have very small ones. So our smallest hummingbirds, uh, like striped-throated hermit or booted racquetails, um, like this one here, um, they're weighing under three grams. So these are the smallest ones, but we also catch um, birds that are the size of toucans. Um, and in terms of body size, this choco toucan here is actually the biggest bird that we've caught so far. But as you might expect for the tropics, that there are also very um, many uh, colorful birds. Um, we have many colorful tanagers 
or other typical tropical species like motmots or trogons. Um, every now and then we also catch um, Andean cock of the rock. Um, this one here is uh, getting processed by our staff member, Christian, who I actually trained over the years and he is now also aiming for his own uh, certification. And um, we even once caught a very rare and the most endangered species of our um, region here, which is a banded crown cuckoo. Um, unfortunately, that time I didn't have yet um, metal bands to, to band it, and I, we just placed color bands on it. Um, now that I have bigger band sizes, we haven't caught any more. Um, but yeah, maybe in the future. <laughs> And um, yeah, sometimes we also capture small raptors like uh, these two here, um, the tiny hawk and barred forest falcon. Um, and when they are around, we always have to uh, keep an eye out because unfortunately they can cause um, casualties in our nets. Um, so we have to be a little bit careful. But the one bird that's actually even um, our most frequent predator in the area is the crimson rumped toucanet. We catch that actually quite often. Um, so since 2014, we have um, banded over 3,500 individual birds um, and we have processed more than 6,000. So um, we actually have quite good recapture rates with our resident bird species. Um, and as you can see here, um, most of our captures actually belong to three families, um, which are the hummingbirds, the phonerids, and the flycatchers. Um, and almost a quarter, quarter of our captures are actually hummingbirds, which is very, very many. <laughs> um, and as you can see, um, we have also a very huge diversity of species. So far we have um, captured over 170 species um, out of 30 different bird families. And although this is actually very exciting, um, this huge diversity also poses quite a challenge. Um, so first our idea was to study demographics, um, to see how our populations here are doing. We wanted to study survival rates of juveniles and adults. Um, we wanted to see how age and gender is distributed within the populations. But then it um, actually quickly became clear to me that many things about tropical birds are still very unexplored. And especially here in Ecuador, where there is hardly any other long-term monitoring program. So when I capture a bird, um, crucial information about the bird's natural history is simply not available. So we don't have a pile guide or a Swenson's guide for bird banders. And um, therefore, when I catch a bird, many of the following questions remain unanswered. Um, which is, um, when does this uh, species breed? What does the juvenile plumage look like? What is the mold strategy and pattern? Um, are there any differences in biometrics that I could use to distinguish between male and females or adults and juveniles? Um, does this bird um, or does the skull ossification in this bird complete and when does that happen? Um, or are there any other relevant features that I could use for aging and sexing it? Um, so Many of these things are unknown to us. And because there's so little known on mold patterns and mold strategies in our birds, it makes it very difficult to determine age and sex. Um, and this is obviously very important uh, to know for demographical research. Um, so this has now become part of my doctoral research here. Um, I study useful aging and sexing techniques for our resident bird community. So I document mold patterns and um, skull ossification, and I take biometric measurements on all of our birds. Um, in addition to that, the timing, duration, and frequency of the breeding and molting are also still unknown for most of our species, um, which is why I'm now also investigating the phenology of the life cycles of our, of our birds. 
in connection with climatic conditions and the availability of food resources, um, such as fruits, insects, and flowers. Um, this means that we're doing monthly fruit and flower surveys. We measure insect abundance with traps, and we have a weather station um, which monitors rainfall and other climatic variables. Um, so you can see that there is much more to learn about the natural history of our resident birds, um, but also about their ecology and behavior. And I want to show you a few examples um, how we have used bird banding as a tool um, for other ecological and behavioral studies. So um, one of our research collaborations um, that we have is with the EFI project. Um, since the beginning of 2017, we're collecting data for this international study, um, which is led by Dr. Catherine, Catherine Graham. Um, and this study investigates the ecology of hummingbird plant interaction networks on different altitudinal levels. Uh, first in the northwest of Ecuador, but now this project also expanded to Costa Rica and Brazil. Um, and the goal of the EFI project is to quantify how interactions between hummingbirds and plants vary across elevation and um, land use gradients. And by evaluating these mutualistic relationships, um, we will be able to better predict how diversity of hummingbirds and plants will be um, influenced by anthropogenic activities. So here at um, Poco del Choco, we are one of many other research sites um, where we study the availability of flower resources and the interaction networks. And that's, that means that the abundance of flowers is counted once per month on a 1.5 kilometer long transect. And the hummingbird plant interactions are investigated by observation but also with the use of um, time-lapse cameras, which we place in front of the plants. And then we check um, the footage for interactions with hummingbirds. So how did we use banding with this project? Um, we wanted to try also a different approach with uh, two Dutch interns and an Ecuadorian university student. Um, to reconstruct the pollination networks um, with the pollen that we could find on the body of hummingbirds. So therefore we caught hummingbirds at different points in the reserve with hummingbird traps um, and also with mist nets. Um, we banded all the individuals and collected the pollen on their body with a foxine gel. Um, and we also collected pollen samples from plants found in the reserve to have a reference collection. Um, the pollen was then analyzed under a microscope. Um, this vaccine gel that, that um, colors the um, pollen grains, and then they can be easily seen under the microscope. And with the help of the herbarium of the Catholic University in Quito, um, we identified the different pollen. Unsurprisingly, we found um, a much greater variety of plants visited by hummingbirds compared to our observations um, with the cameras. Um, but the cameras, we can only place them in the understory. So, of course, we found a lot of more plants that the hummingbirds visit. Um, but despite the help of the herbarium, actually, it still remained quite a challenge to identify all visited plants to the species level because many pollen grains look alike. And um, in the future, we'd need DNA analysis or electron microscopy for more detailed IDs. Um, another way how we implemented banding um, were two internship projects um, that studied the foraging strategies of ant following birds. So in the neotropics here, we have um, and following birds, that means that they're following army ant swarms around in the forest. Um, swarms, they flush insects and the birds feed on them. And um, we target netted different uh, of these ant following species and color banded them for uh, subsequent observation in the field. And there are different behaviors that we can observe and quantify that can give us an idea which species are obligatory, which means that they have to forage around those forms and which are opportunistic. And those behaviors are um,
ANTS forms. Um, but also we have the frequency of bivouac checks. This means that um, the nests of the, those ants, of those nomadic ants, um, they're tracked by the ant following birds and they come in the mornings to check if there's activity around the nest site. Um, and what we can also look at is the response to playback of calls from other ant followers. So we would expect that obligate ant followers respond stronger to calls of other ant followers because they can use those calls to locate ant swarms. And likewise, um, the calls of obligate followers should also track more other ant followers. Um, so while one student focused on those playback experiments, the other student studied the frequency of foraging around ant swarms and the frequency of bivouac checks. Um, and both students came to the same conclusion that we have three obligate species in the reserve, which are celadons, ant bird, bicolored ant bird, and plain brown wood creep. Um, another research collaboration, which is maybe also the reason that I got invited to talk about our work uh, here, is our participation with MOSI and the Genoscape project um, to study migratory birds their populations and migratory routes. Um, and since 2018, I share our banding data with the Institute for Bird Populations. Um, and I also collect tail feathers from uh, migrants for a genetic analysis, um, which is then used to determine which population um, a migratory bird belongs to. Um, one of the most captured species we have here is the Swainson thrush. Um, unfortunately, our capture rates are quite low and we haven't had any recoveries in North America or somewhere else yet. Um, but it has already been quite interesting to see that some of the individuals that we have initially banded at Umpoku de Chocó um, have returned to our site in uh, following years. And some of the other migrants that we catch are, for example, summer tanagers, or Acadian flycatchers. As I mentioned, we haven't had any recovery yet of one of our um, birds. Um, um, and in almost seven years of banding here, we only had one recovery from another site. Um, that was in March 2019 when we captured a female club winged mannequin uh, with a band on it that wasn't ours. Um, this one only had four digits and no address stamp. So I placed one of our bands um, with an address stamp on it um, because who knows, maybe it gets recaptured somewhere again. Um, but the problem is that there is no system in place in Ecuador to, band, uh, to, to report a banded bird. Um, so I had to ask around on the social media and write some emails to birder friends to find out where this bird came from. Um, and I actually found out, and it came from Mindo, that's uh, 16 kilometers away, where it had been banded 15 months earlier. Um, but also the fact that this bird uh, ended up with two bands brings me to one of the other challenges here in Ecuador is that we don't have a national banding scheme. So um, you see that we don't have a centralized database. Um, and this actually makes the coordination and the exchange of information quite difficult. Um, and another fact making coordination difficult is also that methods aren't standardized. Um, so the colleagues um, who had first banded this mannequin, they used a different uh, system for aging the birds. They were still using the um, calendar based um, age system. We are using the WRP here now. Um, and they also use different categories for scoring fat and where, et cetera. So um, one challenge is that although there are a few other organizations in the country that are running long-term monitoring studies, all those places actually manage their own study design, their own bands, their own databases, their own protocols, and their own schedules. Um, and apart from those projects, um, where the birds are actually banded, 
There are also numerous places in Ecuador where biologists or consultants capture birds with mist nets without actually banding them. Um, and unfortunately, the simple capture of a bird without putting a band on them results in missed opportunities for demographic research. Um, and another concern is that many of those people working with mist nets don't even have the proper training to capture and handle birds. So how can this actually be possible? Uh, well, it's due to our permitting process here. Um, so if you want to ban, uh, if you want to capture a bird in Ecuador, you need a research permit, um, which is handed out by our Ministry of Environment. And in order to get that permit, um, you have to write a research proposal, and then you can attain your research permit. So it's actually quite easier easy because it's rather a bureaucratical obstacle um, because the decision if you get a permit or not isn't based on your skills to capture or ban birds. It's rather a question of completing all the requirements for the paperwork and filling out everything. Um, so the permit isn't based on the verification of skills and there is no um, banding certification or whatsoever needed. And it actually even gets worse somehow because ironically the Ministry of Environment even requires the use of mist nets for most environmental impact studies or surveys as a proof. Um, and although maybe less invasive methods for a survey would be much more suitable. So we knew about these problems already for a while um, and we've been discussing this since um, 2014 during our biannual ornithology meeting. Um, but then after that, nothing really happened. Then in 2018, we gave it another try and met again with a few organizations, um, which is basically a group of friends. <laughs> but um, it also includes um, people from Aves y Conservación, which is the partner of bird life here in Ecuador. Um, so we had the idea of creating a network of bird banders in Ecuador, which we then um, tentatively called Red de Anijadores de Aves Ecuador. And we agreed that we would like to promote the ethics of bird banding in Ecuador, to build a collaborative network, to share knowledge and data, to standardize our measurements and techniques, to provide training and certification opportunities, um, to prepare identification materials for banders, and then also finally to elaborate regulations um, for capturing, capturing and marking birds together with the Ministry of Environment. So that's actually quite a lot. Um, and obviously all of this isn't just done in one single step. So our approach was to first organize bird banding workshops to train more people. So we held the first workshop in the reserve Hamakwake in 2018, then a second one in 2019 uh, here at the Bokolej Co. Uh, both of these workshops were supported by the IDP. In the first workshop, I actually also met Steve. And um, we had trainers, NIBC trainers from Costa Rica, the US and Mexico join us. Um, both workshops were directed towards Ecuadorian banders, and most of the participants had actually already used mist nets. Some of them had banded birds, um, but none of them knew how to age or sex a bird. So for about a week, we taught them how to safely capture and band birds and how to age them with the um, WRP system. Um, and in 2020, we actually also already had planned a third workshop and we wanted to hold our first certification session here. Um, but we had to postpone this due to the pandemic, obviously. And hopefully we can continue this work then next year. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic and maybe some other factors have also debilitated our work as a network a little bit. Um, because some of our partners aren't uh, banding anymore. Um, hopefully they'll do it this again in the future. But um, yeah, at the moment, there are not too many people actually doing this. So um, what can we do here at Onpoko del Choco? Um, um, we will definitely organize more workshops in the future. Um, and my dear is also to offer banding workshops as part of our study abroad program. 
So we can create a fund um, to provide training opportunities for Ecuadorians. Um, because apart from the workshops, the Ecuadorian students are actually also looking for more practical training opportunities. So we want to offer them the participation in our monitoring program at a low cost. Um, of course, as part of my PhD research, we will also continue to study our different bird species and compile information um, that will help us to age and sex our birds and eventually also improve the demographic research. And um, we will definitely also continue with our environmental education program and want to do um, bird banding demonstrations on a more regular basis. And in the future, future, <laughs> Um, yeah, there are a couple of dreams that I still have. Um, this um, club wing mannequin recovery at the reserve is actually quite a good example that we hardly know anything yet about movements of tropical birds. Uh, so my plan would be to establish more banding stations in Ecuador, which can help us study their movements and make better decisions for the uh, conservation of our bird species. Um, for example, I would love to implement a network of motors antennas in our region. Um, but one major challenge that I have never mentioned so far is um, that there is definitely a lack of money and funding. Um, funding for research projects in Ecuador is hard to get. And even worse, um, if we're talking about long term research, um, because most research grants I know are directed towards short term projects. And writing grant proposals obviously, obviously also takes time. Um, so for us, ecotourism and scientific tourism plus crowdfunding has been quite a good solution. But I'm always happy to hear about other ideas or suggestions on how we could fund our work. Um, so please reach out to me. Um, and here you'll have my contact info. Um, so if you're interested in our work, you can also follow us on social media, on Instagram and Facebook. And um, thank you so much for listening. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, I don't get the chance to do this right now, but please feel free to shoot me an email um, if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, I think the work that you're doing is such a great example of all the information that we can get when we have a bird in the hand. Um, there's so much information, just basic ecology, that is the basis for bird conservation um, that you get when you, when you capture the birds. It's, it's about so much more than just putting that little metal band on it. Oh yeah, yes. There's so much more behind it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I remember when we did it the first yeah. time, there were a couple questions about, um, do you accept volunteers if somebody wants to come down and work at your station? Um, long term, short term, what do they do? Yes, both things. So <laughs> um, we have, I mean, we have different programs. If you're a skilled bird bander um, and you know what you're doing, um, we are happy to take people as volunteers. Um, the, the difference for us here is the costs. Um, so so we, we differentiate between people that are actually of help or people that get trained. Um, we also provide training for students, so if you come with no skills at all, um, we also provide training um, and that can be anything starting like from a month to six months, if you want to say that long. Um, the same goes for volunteers, um, but yeah, obviously the cost would differ depending on the, on the skills that people come with. All right, thank you so much, Nicole. We really appreciate your time. Um, Keep up the good work. It's it's a pleasure seeing you again. And um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, they can email Nicole at uh, at the email address there. And stay tuned for the Perfect. for uh, next month. It's gonna we're gonna talk about the Bird Genus Game Project in Mexico um, with uh, Rafa Rueda Hernandez, who's gonna give a presentation. Details to follow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And was that again? In uh, in August, toward the end of August. I, I don't have the exact date yet. I'll post yeah. that. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks. We'll be there. <laughs> Thank you.